Do please take a seat. So let me add my welcome here to the Met today, especially if you're visiting us on this long weekend. Great to have you with us. Very warm welcome, and we'd love to have the opportunity at the end, we trust, to get to know you a little bit. We're working through uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians as a church family, and today we are in chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and it would be great if you could take up uh, a Bible and turn there with me so you're able to follow what it is we're doing and where it is we're going. Page 959, if you're using a church Bible, 1 Corinthians 12, and let me read the chapter for us. Paul writes this, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit— And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And on our unrepresentable parts, we are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the membership may have the same care for one another." If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. Let's pray together as we come to the Word of God. God our Father, we recognize that there is so much yet for us to understand and to take hold of in the Christian life. And we pray that you would work powerfully through your word this morning and by your Holy Spirit, that you would instruct us and shape our thinking and redirect our affections, help us to think as you think and to love and prize the things you love. And so more and more to be the people you have called and created us to be in Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you uh, enjoy gardening. I have a kind of love-hate relationship with it myself. 
It can be a, a nice diversion, I guess, from time to time, maybe even a little bit therapeutic. But it's something, you know, that's never done, is it? It's never complete, and it's certainly never perfect. And it's, it's hard, actually, I find, not to fall into a kind of garden envy when I, you know, walk around the neighborhood and see what others have done, or in some cases, this is particularly hard when it's evident that their professional landscapers have been at work shaping it all for them. I'm always trying to uh, take inspiration from the best that I see, and I've, I've noticed, I think, that there are essentially two types of artistic philosophy governing the gardens, at least around us in our neighborhood. Some, some will plant their, their beds, their gardens, along the principle of sameness, and some will plant, by contrast, on the principle of diversity. That is, some will obviously think that beauty is found in everything being the same. A, a bed along the front of the house that is, you know, 100% English lavender or whatever it is, nothing else in that bed. Others will feel that a bed that's a, a mixture, you know, of shrubs and perennials and annuals of all different colors and types, that's beauty for them. I wonder which is your preference, which way you lean, where you are most inclined to find beauty. Is it in sameness or is it in diversity? In our passage today, the Apostle Paul is at pains to show us that in God's design for his people and his church, for the church of Jesus Christ, he has opted for diversity over sameness. He has made his church beautiful in its diversity. Even as the church is one unified body in Christ, that unity is expressed in a great diversity, and that is a very beautiful thing. Now, in a sense, we are continuing on here from the theme of the previous chapter. You'll remember that at the beginning of the last chapter, Paul moved into the territory of the church's collective life and the church's collective worshiped worship, and he looked at how we approach certain types of diversity within the church, the diversity of the sexes and of socioeconomic standing. Now in chapter 12, he considers how we handle another type of diversity, the diversity of the spiritual gifts. As we walk through this passage together, we're going to see that Paul is going to give us a key theological insight, followed by a key image that drives home his point, and then together I want to consider the key implications from all of this. So we've got the key insight, the key image, and then the key implications at the end. That's where we're going this morning. The beauty of unity in diversity, we begin with the key insight. Notice the opening verses with me again, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. As we've seen before in this letter, when Paul opens a topic by saying, now concerning, he is addressing an issue that the Corinthians have raised in their own letter to him, which he has received. He's getting back to them on a question that they've been asking. And they are curious, evidently, about spiritual gifts, not least the gift of tongues, as we're going to see over the next couple of chapters. The Corinthians in their background had seen evidence of dark spirituality in their pre-conversion days in the idol temples. They'd had some experience of this. Verse 2, they'd seen demonic work, and Paul has given reference before to the work of demons in, in connection with idols, you may remember, earlier in the book. And, and many of these now Christians would have been involved in idol worship before they came to Christ. And so now that they're Christians and in the church, they want to know if other professing Christians within the congregation are showing signs of spiritual activity, signs that something supernatural is at work within them, how do we filter out the good from the bad, the genuine from the counterfeit? So that's a good question, isn't it? That, I think that's a valid concern. And Paul has actually a pretty simple answer for them, a pretty clear answer. The key evidence, you'll notice, of the Holy Spirit's activity in a person's life is what they have to say about Jesus Christ. So, verse 3, if someone speaks a curse against Jesus Christ, we know that the Spirit of the living God is not at work within them. But conversely, if a person confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
Well, that is evidence that the Spirit of God has opened their eyes to the truth and has overcome their sinful inclination to resist the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And by the way, that profession of faith, it is a very great miracle, isn't it? You know, we could imagine that the uh, visibly dramatic things are the special evidences of the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, performing a miracle, speaking in tongues, but a mere, you know, profession of faith, that's not much, is it, to write home about, we might say. But let's just mark this in our minds. A person who is naturally hostile to God, as we all are in our sinful independence and rebellion, a person who is naturally scornful of Jesus Christ, and our world is scornful of Jesus Christ, such a person coming to believe that his word is true and his gospel is life and his service is perfect freedom, a person repenting and believing in the gospel, a person making Jesus Christ Lord, that's a miracle. That's the miracle of miracles. Something profound has happened in their heart and life for that to take place, and it's evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, this is the unifying feature of all true Christians, the confession that Jesus is Lord. But this unity in the confession of Christ and in the life of the Spirit, this will be expressed then in tremendous diversity, diversity actually that reflects God himself. Notice this with me, verse 4. Now, there are various gifts but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. Those are very fascinating verses, not least for the fact that they are profoundly Trinitarian. Did you see how the giving of the gifts and the empowering of service within the church of God is a fundamentally Trinitarian activity? There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one confessed as Lord in verse 3. There are varieties of activities, but the same God, God the Father who empowers them. The Spirit, the Son, the Father, giving gifts to believers, empowering their service within the church. And friends, doesn't that reflect the very character and identity of God? The, the one God who exists eternally and indivisibly in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who creates a unified people in Christ, who receive then a variety of gifts to live together and serve together in unity, but in distinction. So if we are to summarize the key insight that Paul has for us here on spiritual gifts, it is simply this, the triune God gives a variety of gifts to all who confess Jesus as Lord. That's it. That's the insight. All true believers have gifts. They will be varied, but they come from the one triune God, and in that, they reflect both his unity and diversity. We're all part of the same mission. We serve the same Lord. We all have the same confession. But each of us has our own particular role and our own particular contribution to make. Verse 7. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then Paul lists a variety of gifts, and then we'll come back to that in a minute. And then he returns to this emphasis on unity in diversity in verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. The one Lord, he gives a variety of gifts to his people for their common good. Where the triune God is powerfully at work, we should expect to see his unified work expressed in this diversity. Remember again why Paul is saying this. The background of these converted Gentiles in idol worship is making them just a little bit jumpy. In all the variety of spirituality in the church, are we seeing the genuine work of God? Some will be asking. Should the variety frighten us? No. Expect diversity among the people who confess Jesus as Lord. Now, in the midst of all this, Paul gives us an overview of some different types of gifts. It's not an exhaustive list, 
There are other gifts mentioned in other places. He doesn't explain all the gifts, so some are actually a little bit hard to define. But I want to keep in mind, as we look at the list, his main point. His main point is that we should expect diversity. His central concern here is not to define the gifts, which we might appreciate, but rather to emphasize that they are going to be varied. There are gifts of speaking and wisdom and knowledge, verse 8, probably both referring to opening up God's Word and sharing spirit-given wisdom in specific situations. To some, there is a special measure of faith, verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Some, the ability to heal. To some, miracles, verse 10. To some, prophesying, which may even mean preaching. That's a possible reading of that. To some, spiritual discernment. To some, speaking in tongues, whether that be a spiritual or an angelic language, or whether it be human languages that had not previously been learned, as we see in the book of Acts. What does each one of these look like? Do they all continue beyond the apostolic age? Should every church exhibit every one? Paul doesn't actually answer all those questions here. The, the list of spiritual gifts here and the list a little later in the chapter, they, they don't overlap completely. They differ a little bit. So we certainly shouldn't take the list as being comprehensive or even normative. Paul doesn't really develop the list at this point. <coughs> Excuse me. He simply rattles off the list without comment. And again, his point is simply that we ought to expect a diversity where the triune God is at work. The closest he gets to explaining the nature of the gifts is actually the comment there in verse 7, where he tells us that all these gifts are for the common good, for the good of the whole church family. Where the triune God is at work, saving lost people and making us one in Christ, where Jesus Christ is confessed as Lord, we should expect to see this beauty of unity expressed in diversity. Well, that's the key insight that Paul has for us here. Now he moves on to give us the key image that brings this principle to life for us, and this image is quite simply that of a human body, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. As we come to Christ, and as we are brought into the reality of life in Him through the Holy Spirit, as we are brought together from disparate backgrounds, Jew and Greek, slave and free, we're brought together into this new spiritual reality. We are made one in the body of Christ. It's worth noting here that Paul presents baptism in the Spirit as being the foundational experience of the believer in conversion. There's sometimes a little bit of debate in this area. That's why I mention it. Some suggest that uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit is a secondary experience for the Christian, some kind of higher experience that only some enter into. But as John Stott memorably put it, the gift of the Holy Spirit is a universal Christian experience because it is an initial Christian experience. That is, coming into the body of Christ being bapt involves being baptized in the one spirit and receiving the spiritual gifts that allow the body to function. Now, Paul wants to just dwell on this image a little bit together, that of the body. He wants us to picture it, and he wants us to consider what it really means for Christians to be the body of Christ. In particular, he wants to bring some special encouragement to those who think perhaps too little of themselves and their gifts, those who think that their gifts really aren't all that significant, aren't all that valuable to the church. Maybe they're the less visible gifts, not upfront and attention-grabbing, and they tend to think, well, my contribution, it doesn't matter all that much. What do I really have to offer? And maybe that's you, actually. You see people serving in the church in some visible ways. There are leaders. There are those who teach. There are those who have musical gifts. They, they seem capable. They seem to have an impact. And your gift is more behind the scenes, and you wonder if you're really that valuable to the body. 
Well, Paul won't allow that line of thought to get very far. He has some very direct words of encouragement for those who may feel that way. For you, if you feel that way. Verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. You know, the, the foot might feel it's less valuable than the hand. After all, it's often kind of, you know, hidden away in socks and shoes. And for some people, when the foot makes an appearance in the summer sandals, you, you wish it were still hidden away, actually. You know, the foot can have a certain type of impact on air quality that the hand doesn't. And, and you know, the foot could be just a little bit self-conscious about all of that. It could feel envious of the much more presentable hand. Well, it can feel as envious as it wants to feel, but it's still part of the body. And a body without a foot is a body that has really lost something. You know, the ear might feel envious of the eye. You know, the eye can sparkle. And when two young people fall in love, one doesn't stare deeply into the ear of the other. No, it's the eye that gets the attention. But however envious an ear might be of an eye, it is actually indispensable. A body without an ear has lost something. And if there was no hearing, well, that's a big loss for the body. If the whole body were just one giant eye, as Paul invites us to consider, I mean, just picture this, verse 17, well, that would lead to certain inevitable limitations. A, a dislodged eye just kind of rolling around the place would be quite unsettling for everyone concerned. <clears throat> Equally so, a detached ear lounging around the place in a sort of languid and floppy way, that's, a, that's actually quite an unpleasant thought. That's an unappealing image. And of course, the nose is needed. The sense of smell is important, verse 17, even when the foot is doing its worst with the air quality. No, let's set aside the inferiority complex, says Paul. Let's not be ridiculous here. He's pointing us to the, he's taking us to the point of ridiculousness with the image. Each and every part matters. And let's remember that God has arranged it all this way, verse 18. Uh, one commentator I read adds in the image of a car to help us think about this from another angle. And, and he highlights the fact that in the mechanical complexity of a car, the tiny plug at the bottom of the oil pan, the, the plug that keeps the oil from draining out when you're driving your car, it's small and it's simple and it's usually hidden discreetly away, but it is so vital, isn't it? You know, that illustration kind of resonated with me this week in a very special way. <clears throat> I took the, uh, the car into the dealer this week, and when I got the call a few hours later telling me that the car was done, they said, it's all ready, you can come and get it, but were you aware, sir, of the major oil leak in your engine? A seal has gone in the engine. It's a major leak. It'll take us 10 hours of disassembly and reassembly to fix it. That'll be a couple thousand dollars. We can't do it today, but you won't want to drive far. <clears throat> Well, whew, my heart sank. I, I was a little confused. I actually went out to the parking lot here, and I, I checked the place where I normally park. Someone else was parking there, so I actually got down on my hands and knees and kind of peered under the car. They must have wondered what I was doing. You know, had I missed the leak? Well, no, no, no oil patches on the ground. Anyway, to make a long story short, I, I went over there pretty quick, and, and they, they put up the car on the hoist to show me this great leak, and I had a good chance to inspect the oil pan and saw that little plug holding it all together. I'd never actually looked at the car from that perspective. And while I was down there with the tech, he, young guy, he kind of went quiet for a moment. And this look of sort of dawning realization came over his uh, face. And after a second or two, he admitted, you know, uh, it was another customer's car of the same model that had the, the big leak. He'd mixed them up by accident. Well, I practically hugged the poor guy for joy. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I did think as I was down there how very important that little drain plug is. If it comes loose, if it falls off on the highway, your engine is toast. Each part matters. Even the most easily overlooked, even the most unseen. Now, that's one dynamic that Paul wants to address with this image, the fear that individuals might feel inferior, unimportant, lesser in some way. And, and if that's you, I know it'll actually be a number because I've talked with some who feel this way. If that's you, have a look at the picture. Consider how indispensable 
Each part is to the body, each person, and that means you. But now Paul, he turns to another concern, another dynamic, actually the polar opposite concern. He has come to sense that there are some within the church family who are taking an excessive pride in the particular gifts that they've been given by God. Some with perhaps more visible or audible or upfront kind of gifts were evidently looking down on others whose gifts seem less impressive. And of course, we can see how easily that might happen too. The church is a family. We're focused together on a rescue mission. The church is here for the glory of God and for the help of his people, but all too easily the church can become a showcase for the gifts and abilities of individuals, a place for performance rather than for service. Church historian Carl Truman has observed how in our contemporary society, key institutions, and especially educational institutions, have shifted from a historical focus on formation and have now become venues that enable performance. Just think about that. That's very interesting insight. So in a former era, schools and colleges and universities were places where we sent our young people to be formed by their teachers, and by the wisdom and knowledge accumulated by those who had gone before us. But now we send our young people to school and college and university so that their inner abilities and their inner gifts can be given expression and can flower and be seen. It's about performance. And the reason for this shift, insofar as it's real and insofar as Truman is onto something, the reason, he says, is that we have zeroed in on the inner self and the individual as the all-important locus of truth. What's important and what's true is what's found inside me. And I need to express it, and I need to have other people validate it all the time. And Truman calls this outlook the outlook of expressive individualism. I don't know what you make of that. I personally think that Truman's on to something there. I think he's observing a real phenomenon. But what he observes in the public institutions of society is, I think, a real danger for the church in our age too. If you and I imbibe the spirit of the age, we run the risk of seeing the church as a place where we have an opportunity to perform, to express ourselves, to exhibit our gifts and then be validated all the time, rather than as a place to serve others for the common good. The Corinthian cultural context was, of course, very different. No one had heard of expressive individualism 2,000 years ago, and they could be thankful for that, actually. But the human heart really hasn't changed all that much. And the instinct to seek attention and affirmation was there in Corinth just as much as it is here today. And, and Paul just doesn't have any time for those who want to use their gifts to bolster their egos. And he especially doesn't have time for those who would look down on others in their gifts as being something lesser. In fact, the very notion is totally at odds with the concept of being part of the body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable, and on the parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor in the church. In the family of God, the Lord has designed things and distributed gifts in such a way that every person and every person's gifts matter. The visible gifts, the upfront gifts, and the behind the scenes gifts, the gifts that others notice, and the gifts that go largely unseen, they all matter. Those who teach, yes, we need them. Those who speak words of wisdom, we need them. Those who do administration, we really need them. Those who have the gift of helping, helping with practicalities, helping where there's a need, we need them. Those who have a special gift for faith and a gift for prayer, we need them. The body works as a unit and every part matters. One thing that can happen, and perhaps you've observed this or you've lived through this, you've experienced this, one thing that can happen is that if a church or a group prioritizes particular gifts, especially the more dramatic gifts like speaking in tongues, 
and takes a, a particular gift as really being the sign of being truly spiritual, if you then don't exhibit that gift, may, maybe they presume you're not even saved. At very least, you haven't reached the full experience of Christian spirituality. You're something lesser. And you know, that kind of attitude can be so damaging and so divisive. And if you've lived through an experience like that, you'll know how damaging it is. But, but we need to see here how badly that attitude misunderstands the nature of the body. People have different gifts, and we must not despise or disparage the gifts of others. One key question that arises in this discussion, and you may be asking this question, is whether all the gifts mentioned here continue today. That's a, that's a hot-button issue in certain circles. It's, it's worth noting clearly that at least one of the gifts mentioned here does not continue today. Paul lists the role of being an apostle there in verse 28. An apostle is, by definition, an eyewitness of Jesus' earthly life who was commissioned by him, one of the twelve and that's time limited, but then we get to miracles, healings, and speaking in tongues, and we've got to acknowledge that opinions on this one's going to differ. And, and I want to say, I think there's room for us to disagree on this, but a couple of factors need to be kept in mind, whatever view we end up taking. The first is that there will be variety in the gifts, variety among individuals, and variety among congregations. So let's not insist on uniformity where we're being encouraged here to see diversity. Let's not assume that all Christians or all churches must look the same with respect to the gifts. And it's worth considering as well that the era of the ministry of Jesus on earth and of the apostles was a very special time. One of the ways that God the Father confirmed and validated the ministry and message of Jesus and the apostles was through signs and wonders and various Miracles. Let me just mention a cross-reference here that may be helpful. This is Hebrews 2 and verse 4. The writer to the Hebrews is speaking of the initial proclamation of the gospel through Jesus and the eyewitnesses here, and he says this, Hebrews 2 and verse 4 for your notes. He says, the message was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, declared by Jesus, attested by the eyewitnesses, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. What's he saying? There was a special purpose of those signs and wonders and various gifts to confirm the truth of the gospel when it was first proclaimed by Jesus and the apostles. And at very least, that tells us that we should not be surprised if those signs are less in evidence in the church today. You see, the message has been proclaimed, and it has been validated, and it has been set down in the New Testament. And so that special purpose for that era has, in a fundamental sense, been accomplished. Now, that doesn't settle all the debate and discussion, perhaps. But it does mean that we need to be careful not to assume that a church is unspiritual if there's not regular evidence of all these gifts. The beauty of unity in diversity, the insight, the image, and as we draw to a close, a few key implications. Let me mention three. Number one, the Christian life is designed to be lived together. This whole picture of the body and this whole idea of gifts being given so that we might serve one another it impresses upon us the essential nature, doesn't it, of Christian community. We are not designed to live the Christian life in isolation and on our own. That idea, it is completely foreign to this chapter and to Paul's thought. One of the commentators I read in my study of this chapter this week wrote of his personal horror when he once heard about a drive through church somewhere in America. This was a British commentator. A drive through church where you could drive in and tune your radio to a certain frequency and hear the live feed and you would never le need to leave your car. I actually, I remember seeing one of those in Florida one time. I was actually quite intrigued. But this writer, he was completely shocked by the idea and understandably so. But as I reflected on that, and the book was published about a decade ago, I, I reflected on it from the post-COVID perspective, and I, I thought, you know, the idea would shock us less, wouldn't it? 
We're so accustomed now to the idea of online church. It's become very commonplace. And of course, an online feed is a real gift to those who are isolated for reasons beyond their own control, not least because of poor health. An online feed is a tremendous gift to those who just can't be here. But it's not the ideal, and it's not the design. And we should never settle for it if we can avoid it. No, if you're a Christian believer, you need to be part of a living Christian community where the Lord can use the gifts of others to strengthen and encourage you and where you can use your gifts to serve and encourage others. And if you don't have that, if you're not prioritizing it at the minute, let me just encourage you to take that as an important implication of what we've seen here in the Scriptures today. Take it and let me say, act upon it. Number two, if you confess Jesus as Lord, you have spiritual gifts. If you're a true believer, if you've trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you've made him Lord of your life, then he has given you gifts by the Holy Spirit to serve in his church. You may not know what those gifts are yet, but if you make yourself available to serve, I can tell you this, you will discover what they are. If you try and serve in different areas of church where there's need, others will see your gifts and they'll tell you. And they'll invite you to serve more and more in the areas where your gift becomes evident. And you'll take a delight in that. Do you know what your gifts are? Have you made yourself available to serve? Number three, your gifts matter to the body. You will have gifts, whatever you might think or feel. And the body of Christ needs you and your contribution. The body will not be healthy and it will not be whole if the members of the body are not functioning within the body. You know, there's so much to do, isn't there, within the life of the church, so many practical needs to be met, so many in the community to reach with the good news of Jesus Christ, so so many members who need encouragement and help and care, so much teaching to do, so much administration, and on and on and on it goes, and the the work simply will be stunted if the gifts of the Spirit are not being used. And you individually won't be healthy either, by the way, in your spiritual life. A foot that never moves is not going to be a healthy foot. An eye that never opens is not going to be a healthy eye. And a Christian who never serves and never uses their gift, well, it is not a recipe for flourishing in the Christian life, is it? We're thankful to be going to the three services here at the Met in September. As Greg mentioned, we're in a season of some growth, and every ministry area is planning for increased capacity in the fall, and that brings a challenge, and it brings opportunity. It means that we're going to need all hands on deck, and it means that there will be expanded opportunities for everyone to serve. Those who have been on the sidelines now have the added prompt and the added opening to step forward and to serve. We need you. The body will be hindered without your gifts being put to use. Again, where can you serve? Where can you make yourself available? The unity that God creates in diversity, the diversity he allows to flourish in unity, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I wonder where you feel the challenge of this, the encouragement of it. I wonder where it hits home for you. Maybe your outlook and your perspective has just been out of kilter on this, and you've overvalued or you've undervalued certain gifts, and and this is now a reset for your outlook. Maybe you've had too low a view of your own gifts, and maybe you've been disconnected from the life of the church for using them, and perhaps today is the day you resolve to set that right to renew your commitment to the life of the local church, to serve as God has gifted you to serve, to see how he might use you to serve the wider body in this season ahead for his people's good, for your health, and for his glory. Let's pray together as we close. Our Father, we thank you for your wondrous design of the church, for the miracle of grace that you would include us within your body through the redemption that is ours in Christ. We pray that you would help us to be those who value the gifts of others and who serve willingly with the gifts that have been given, that the body might be healthy and that it might grow for your honor and glory. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.